Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening wherever you are in the world. My name is Jade, and this is How to App on iOS, and it is 2022 here in Australia. And today we're going to be hanging out with Kev Hart. And first, we're going to kick off with a song from Metal Shack by Kev Hart. This is Zero. Everybody, welcome to the show. Happy New Year to those in Australia first, because it is 2022 right now. My name's Jay. This is How to App on iOS. And to those who are waiting for the new year to arrive, guess what? We're still alive. <laughs> nothing blew up. Nothing exploded. The world didn't end, unfortunately. Uh, so <laughs> we're all still here. And it's eight o'clock in the morning, and I'm having my first scotch. And uh, scotch and dry. Mm. Boom. Good stuff. I can see. Why have I got Kev on the other side who's frozen on my screen? I don't know why that is, but we'll find out. Uh, <laughs> there's always technical issues. I hope you're all doing well. Yeah. Um, today on the show, we have a very, very special guest. Uh, and it's not frozen now, so that's cool. Very, very special guest. A friend of mine, a, a bandmate of mine, an 
awesome riffing machine. This dude, uh, if you want to talk about metal, this is the dude to have on the show. I've been waiting a long time to do this, and I couldn't think of a better day to do it than the first day of uh, January. <laughs> Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, as soon as I get my shit together here and unmute him and all this stuff, welcome to the show, please. The amazing, the riffing machine, Kev Hart, boom. As I, as I drink daintily from my straw. <laughs> Very happy metal of me. So metal, man. <laughs> Folks, I don't know if you see, Kev's got a metal straw. It is actually made of metal. Look at that. <laughs> it's it fucking recyclable. Oh, there's the first fuck bomb of the night. It's fucking recyclable, so you know. That's how we do it. Swearing is going to be the thing of the night. People, if you are... Um, yeah, if you're if you're sensitive to swearing, this ain't the show for you. Trust me on that. Let me put some background music on. So how's it going, Kev? Yeah, it's going fucking good. Just getting ready for the new year. Not to give a fuck about the new year, but you know, just getting ready for the new year. So happy fucking new year, everybody. Who gives a fuck? <laughs> Today we've got a swear jar running. Now, if you'd like to contribute to it, just in case the show does get utterly demonetized, feel free to super chat if you like. Feel free to super chat, you know, just for Christmas, even though Christmas is over. Um, but yeah, that's a thing because we could get demonetized, but we're not going to give a shit about swearing. Um, all right, so I forgot to even say at the intro, uh, dude. Not only are you an amazing guitarist, you are a filmmaker as well. And I want to delve into that shortly. But first, let's ask two questions. I've got two questions for you today. One's the basic one, and then I'm going to expand on it. What does music mean to you, Kev? Probably more than I realized, and, and a lot that I'd forgotten about. I mean, I, had, I hadn't picked up a guitar for about 10 years until last year. So I really hadn't played. It was just because of family and, and work and with Matthew's, excuse me, situation, which you're aware of. So it meant more to me than what I realized because I really missed it. And I didn't realize how much I missed it until I picked the guitar up. And that's probably the reason why I keep churning out these fucking songs because it was 10 years of a, uh, riffs just stuck in your head so yeah it meant more than i realized is that why you're such a prolific motherfucker <laughs> <laughs> no maybe i don't know i mean i'm i'm just i've got like this ocd thing maybe people watching can relate but if you get like a riff in your head as long as the riff's good i have to finish the song so the chances are as you know with my stuff there's a lot of riffs yeah and i tend to try and get them into a tune Rarely is it something that's like straightforward, like Zero, the track you just played, was probably the most straightforward song that I'd done in a while. But uh, yeah, it probably is. You know, you just fucking, the excitement of discovering rec home recording and things, which I really wasn't paying attention to or, or aware of, uh, is, is another reason. Because, you know, as you know, when you're a kid or, you know, when you're in a fucking band 20 years ago, you have to play gigs and scrape the money to record demos but now you're just like i'll be dead so i'll just go up to the fucking room and, and riff and, and riff you do uh, <laughs> i can't keep up <laughs> thank you ivan idea first a swear jar super chat for the day from who would have guessed ivan idea <laughs> it's nowhere near enough ivan. <laughs> don't fucking no like the bank card out no don't. <laughs> and an, another super chat also thank you very much from uh, let me bring it up on the screen. I can do that these days. Luriality Art. So thank you for contributing to the swear jar. All right. I want to know also, so I'm going to elaborate on that question. What does metal mean to you? Everything. Metal means everything to me. Metal is the first type of music that I recognized. The first type of music that, uh, that really made me block out the world that I grew up in, which I'm sure we'll get into. Um, and it's always been there. It's always been reliable. Well, maybe not, you know, in the fucking nineties, it wasn't, but 
luckily enough, Thanks, some stinky, sweaty bastards from Europe came back and uh, fucking rectified that. But yeah, I, I love metal. I mean, I like different types of music. People might not realize that, but, but I love metal. It's fucking everything. Nothing gives me the feeling that metal gives me. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm exactly the same, you know. Um, and, and I want to talk about that, but expand on it, because, like, that's how that's how our friendship began. Because that, when you're a metalhead, you, there's, there's a connection that only metalheads can really understand. I mean, I, I say it as a throwaway line myself. Without metal, I'd be dead. And it... it you know, mm. and people, I hear people say it about music. And, you know, fair enough, music is the same thing. But but if it wasn't for metal music in particular, I definitely wouldn't be here. It, it got me through so much, and it still does now. It's such an important genre of music, and it's probably one of the most misunderstood genres of music. What are your thoughts on that? For fucking sure. Absolutely. I mean, I'm the same. There was a... Metal kids, it tends to be, you know, people have like a an ideal that you're sort of alone as your outsiders, and like to an extent you are, but it's only because you can't be part of that popular group. But there's a huge group of people when you were a kid that you didn't realize also like the music that you like. So while you were insular to that group, and yes, you were away from the main part of it, you, you grew and you learned more, and you, you, you know, you learn more about music, specifically metal for me. You know, meeting all those people, it opens up your eyes. You get that interest. But without it, without it, I don't know if I'd ever been interested in music. Um, so it's something that, that for me, it gave me something that I was able to do myself by picking up the guitar. You know, it wasn't like you went to, got trained, got guitar lessons or anything like that. It was like a point that I was thinking about this the other day. I don't remember. And this sounds like an ego thing, and it's not. But I don't remember not being able to play the guitar. So that to me is like it's almost like an instinct, an instinctual thing. So once the music was in you, it's like it was like almost automatic. I mean, maybe people at different genres feel the same, but yeah, I, I don't know where it'd be without Mel. Probably be sitting here drinking wine out of a fucking recyclable <laughs> straw made from a made from a fucking squirrel's dick. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Man, you need to send me some of that squirrel's dick stuff that you, we always talk about. I can't. It was the last. It was the, the last, last one. It's extinct now. Yeah, so I'll be um, thank you also to Hambo Hounslow over in New Zealand who sent an eight ninety nine dollar swear jar contribution. Thank you very much. I will get around to saying hello to you all. Uh, we'll, we'll have a chat first, and then we'll, we'll do the hellos. Um, Look, man, I'm going to be honest. For me, like, metal was... All right, so most people know that I'm trans, and I knew that I was trans from a very, very young age. And um, it wasn't that I used metal to hide, but it was extremely convenient. Not only was the music... Because first it was the music. Uh, you know, first I, I, I had a friend who listened to fucking Poison and just fucking Quiet Riot and all this shit. And he was like, yeah, this is really cool. And I was like, yeah, it's kind of cool, but it's just not pushing me over the edge. But as soon as I heard Slayer and as soon as I heard Metallica and Iron Maiden, that edge was pushed. But for me, over the years, metal was a place where I felt comfortable as a trans person hiding from the world to be able to grow my hair long and to be able to wear things that maybe on, on to the normal world would be like, why is that dude wearing kind of like a uh, pleather? What's going on? Is, is, are they queer? So it was a place where I, I felt like I could just blend into this group of people. And it's a, it was a very male dominated genre of music, but it wasn't this, I'm going to smash your head in male dominated genre of things like sport no. where you were able to express yourself. So when I eventually came out to all my metalhead friends, they were the ones who didn't give a shit. But that's always the way, though, isn't it? I mean, like, fucking, when I was, like, a kid, 14, 15, and you start to hang around with those groups, I mean, trans guy, you know, obviously trans folks weren't as prominent then, but I mean, it was full of, all my friends were full of, like, gay guys, fucking lesbian chicks. Nobody give a fuck. All we give a fuck about is, what, did you buy the new Slayer album? Yeah, but I'm gay. I don't give a fuck about that. Did you buy the new Slayer album? I'm not trying to fuck you. I just want to know, did you get the new Slayer album? It, it was, it's more accepting. And I mean... 
obviously I'm sort of biased because I grew up in that world, but you've got a set of eyes and you knew what else lived outside your world. And it always was always more accepting. So I can totally understand why you would feel comfortable with that. And like you say, your mates are like, I don't give a fuck. Yeah. And I think too, lyrically, uh, merchandise wise, I mean, I think back now, I don't know, I want your thoughts on this. We wouldn't live in a culture, I think, of, of bands now selling, you know, relying on so much merchandise if it wasn't for metal bands. Because metal was all about t shirts, man, and merch. And, 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 you know, metal was the thing. Everyone had a black t shirt. Whatever t shirt came out, you had to have it. And I think now you look at, Rock too. bands, everyone relies on merch because no, no one makes money from records. Well, that's always the way. I mean, fucking Maiden being the prime example. I mean, probably like a lot of people, maybe like yourself as well. Maiden was the gateway, and Maiden wasn't just a band; it was a fucking culture. You know, it was like thousands. You could go any any city in the world that was ever there. You would see an Iron Maiden T-shirt all the fucking yeah. time. It didn't matter where you were; you would always see a Maiden T-shirt. And it took the popular music world so long to catch on to that. I mean, those motherfuckers were selling millions of records and millions of fucking T-shirts every city that they fucking went to. And, yeah, it took a while for them to catch on. We knew. But, you know, we're not fucking stupid like a belt. <laughs> we knew. <laughs> we knew shit. We knew. And the posters, man. Like, I had every Iron Maiden poster. So much so, I would filled every wall and they were up on my roof. Every Eddie poster you could get, like, it's, you know, it's... we had that, and then when it moved into like the the heavier side of things, like the tunes and the you know the optic eights of the world, and they had, I mean, those guys were clued in because those were their influences. They just took the British heavy metal scene and adapted to to their own thing without extremity. But fundamentally, at the end of the day, it's really still just traditional metal, just fucking faster and a wee bit heavier. But they took that scene, and you can see it, like especially in the first like couple of Entombed records. I mean, they're really thinking about the artwork, and that, that's also one of the great things about metal bands. They always had awesome artwork, so you would get that, and then you would get a fucking Whitney Houston record, which is a picture of Whitney Houston. Like, you don't know what the fuck Whitney Houston looks like. And it was like, all right, fair enough. But yeah, for me, I was the same. I just had posters everywhere. Yeah. Uh, thank you also, Dr. Zordas, who writes... Fuck me. Another fucking swear jar contribution you rock, Kevin Jade. Thank you, Dr. Zordas, for, sorry, uh, Dr. Zordas. <laughs> I, Although he has kept a PG. Yeah, I know. But, <laughs> but I need to. <laughs> Which in Ireland only applies to people over 60. <laughs> Swingers. <laughs> so maybe not. so I'll, I'll break away from our metal discussion because I want to get back to it because I. I I, I, I want to talk more about metal in this conversation, in this interview today too, because I think it's I think it's really important that people understand the like what metal is about, and you know we'll get back into it. I'll, I'll, I'll do the standard questions that I do, and we'll get those out of the way. So, do you remember the music that was played in your household when you were growing up? Yeah, yeah, yeah it was great. <laughs> I can't wait to hear who it was. Nineteen year, nineteen eighties. <laughs> 1980s politically erupted Ireland. Oh, yeah. Great. <laughs> so, <Not a> way. <laughs> it was like a mixture of traditional music and like rebel music. So I grew up in like a, a Catholic household. So it would always be like, I don't even know who the fuck it was. It all sounded the same. But it was always that music going on. And then there would have been a mixture of like pop music of the day, like Madonna and Michael Jackson oh, and that lovely. sort of shit. But that was, yeah, well, it was my like first exposure to music it was more the traditional thing because i mean being like irish much like australian folks there's not much to fucking do but get pissed so people would you know your family would just have people around every week and they'd bring guitars around and they'd be singing like oh do you remember the time we blew up a mountain wasn't it great or i think that was the song so it was you know stuff like that that you could relate to and you just sat outside with the priest i was like i'm just going to sit outside with the priest it's safer Oh, but that was the, the sort of thing that we had going on in our in our household. It wasn't a hugely musical family. It wasn't like you would be taking fucking notice of the charts and all that sort of shit. But that's the kind of thing. So uh, do you remember the priest's favorite music that used to sit out in the step? <laughs> yeah. He used, he used to sing it in my ear before I went to sleep. <laughs> 
stir with it. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I'm not gonna get down this path. <laughs> yeah, I can. I, I know we're gonna divulge into some dark places today. I, I will warn you guys. Me, me, me and Kev are pretty good friends, and our, our humor is, let's say, um, uh, I touch on the dark side a little bit. <laughs> so if you're honest, <laughs> if you're Thomas. easily Thomas. offended, <laughs> you probably might want to fuck off. <laughs> like. Honestly, um, so do you think any of that music has uh, has had an influence on the on the lyrical stuff that you write? And uh, the, the early days, I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, what I would say there's one thing about that type of music. I mean, I'm I'm not into traditional music, but I do appreciate it, and I probably appreciate it more now for the ability of the artists. I mean. I understand that a lot of that music at the time was political, and I was probably too young to get it, to be honest, even though we lived through it. But in retrospect, when you look at it, I mean, people called them like rebel songs, but obviously there were, the whole situation was going on, on in Ireland. They obviously meant something to people, but they were cleverly put together. Um, I, I don't think it would have had an influence on me if it was. It was very subliminal, very deep in there. Um, not to say my lyrics are deep, but, yeah, I, th- I wouldn't say it had that much of an influence well, on me, no. Just touching on uh, growing up in in Ireland and through all that period of time, I mean, we've talked about this. You know, I, I understand the history of what went down and, and, and with the IRA and all the bombings. But for the Americans out there who don't really know much about history outside of their own country, um, how how was that? Like, it, I mean, uh, it seems like a, a time... It, it, I mean, to be, to be honest... To be, it, we we just lived through it. I mean, it was more, you know, the new like everything, like the fucking news today, like anywhere, you know, with, no matter what's going on in Afghanistan, fucking wherever, it's always like sensationalized to an extent. I mean, we never, you, you just got used to it. I mean, I was born into it, so you were used to seeing like soldiers and things. I mean, the town that I lived in was a very very small town, it got blown up like fucking, I think two, two times. And you'd just be lying on your bed, you know, before you went to school and you hear a big boom. And it's not like you woke up and went, what the fuck's that? You woke up and went, oh, I know what wow. that is. So it, it wasn't as difficult as what people might think. You know, I mean, Bel- Belfast was quite a hot spot, but we lived f- uh, fur- further away from that. I mean, it was still all going on. But, you know, you get up in the morning, you go to school, there'd be like soldiers hiding in the fucking grass really badly, you know, because the grass was like an inch long. But, you know, they were, like, all camouflaged up. And you'd be like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> or they'd be, like, mourning. And they were surprised to do something. <laughs> they were under, like, fucking Steven Seagal or some shit. What the fuck? And they were... <laughs> so, apart from that, like, yeah, it's just, you just get on with it. <laughs> Steven Seagal, man, there's a whole story right there. <laughs> if you haven't, uh, folks, uh, check out any of Steven Seagal's stuff. Away from, um, away from oh, his movies. Oh, hard yeah. to get God. <laughs> Has he got a YouTube channel? I think so. Where he talks and does inspirational shit. It's fucked up. I'm pretty really? sure he does. Where he, he talks about inspiring people. It's like, dude, shut the fuck up, you idiot. Must be on his show in Russia. <laughs> yeah. like um, do you remember the first <laughs> album that was uh, given to you and the first album that you purchased as a youngster? The first album was given to me was uh, Life After Death. Oh, by Iron Maiden. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah, but that was like, a, you know, when your mates she used to fucking tape right. it on a cassette. So they would give you that. It was the first one I got. It wasn't the actual copy. And then when I got fucking a wee shitty job, then I managed to go out and get the vinyl. Uh, that wasn't the first one I purchased, though. The first record I purchased was classic, well-known British thrash pagan metal band Sabbat and their very first album History of a Time to Come which is the fucking balls so that was the first record I ever bought and that blew my mind that was the, that was my entry into extreme metal because beforehand it was like Iron Maiden was the thing for me Priest and Sabbath they were kind of like older bands so I didn't really get into them until I got older but it was like the usual shit Maiden, Slayer Testament, Metallica, uh, maybe Metallica a wee bit, I'm not a fan, 
But yeah, that was that. And then Sabbath was the first album I bought. Look at that shit. You know what I mean? Talk about t-shirts. Yeah, I mean, look at that shit. I mean, it's the great. It's it's probably still the greatest live album of all time. There's no doubt about that. Oh, it's kick ass. I I remember getting it on, uh, I think VHS, and watching it, just going, "How does he sing like that live? How does he do it? How does he maintain that fringe at the same time?" Well, I had the same thing, but when I got my first guitar, which my mum and dad bought me for Christmas, my mum also rented me, because in Ireland, you had to rent VCRs. If you wanted to buy one, they were like fucking two million quid or some shit. I'm exaggerating, a million quid. So so you couldn't like buy tapes or shit. So my mum rented me a VCR on the Live After Dead video when I got my first guitar. So starting on Christmas Eve, like an utter fucking bell end. Thinking it was like Adrian Smith had the clue what the fuck I was doing, but it obviously it obviously ignited something. But yeah, that was so cool. That live after death video, balls, man. Especially yeah, back it then. still is. I, you know, it's funny. I only watched it about a month and a half ago. I was just bored and went, "Oh man, I, I'm just in the mood for it." And you know, sometimes when you you know you have rose colored glasses and you think. You go back and watch something, and then you go, oh, fuck, that was so shit. <laughs> My memories of that, none yeah. of it. I sat all the way through it. What is it? It goes for like two hours, and it was just like glued to it and just loved every second of it. It's uh, it's yeah. fucking great. It, and it's like the whole thing, though, isn't it? It was like the stage. It was like if you're a kid and you're practicing in a fucking room that smells like sweaty balls with three or four other dudes. <laughs> And then, and then you watch that shit, and you go, "What the fuck? It's got like mummies and fucking explosions and shit." Where, like, are, the sweaty, where are the sweaty balls? I remember. <laughs> I don't check any of those sweaty balls. What's going on? It's fucking yeah, too big. Yeah. I, every time I used to watch it, I think. Hang on. Well, the first live video I ever saw, live performance of a metal band, was uh, here in Australia. We had a New Year's Eve special, an Alice Cooper special. And um, this is years ago. And it was the one with um, Kane on guitar where he shoots a fucking... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, and he, the machine gun guitar. Yeah, and he shoots it out. Yeah. And it was, I was like, it was probably like a late 70s kind of thing. And I was, it was a like on just normal commercial television at midnight, Alice Cooper live. And I was just like, oh, fucking hell, man. I think I need to fucking get into stuff like this. This is, I think this is my bag. And then um, Live After Death came along. I was like, fucking Alice who? It's all a bit weak. Alice what? Really? <laughs> so. <laughs> but they were the dudes, though. I mean, for fucking what, a couple of years, me and them were like the guys. They were everywhere. They were the yeah, biggest thing going. Yeah. I mean, and they, amazingly enough, too, they are still incredibly solid players. Like, when when you look at, oh, like, yeah. but I don't want to throw Metallica on the bus, but I do. I, I you know, Metallica um, were one of the bands for me that I got it into a so, lot. Like most people who got into them early, got into them probably up to Justice for All, and then everything else afterwards been bog. Um, but it seemed like they got they they got less talented Metallica as they went on, where Iron Maiden just got better and better and better and better. Yeah, Metallica just got way much of money and interested in saving fucking hard parts or some shit. They just went away from They just went away from their music. I, was, I mean, I was the same. Up until Injustice for All, I was like, hobby days. But after, I mean, some of the stuff afterwards, there was like some of the stuff on load and things I didn't mind, but it was it was too late for me. I was lost in the fucking the realms of crusty filth from Europe, so I had no interest. Whenever I think of uh, Metallica post Black Album, <laughs> I always think of that scene from that um, that documentary they did where they're all having a nervous breakdown as alcoholics, and uh, Jason Newstead was playing basketball with a with a handicapped kid, and he puts the ball through the hoop in slow motion. <laughs> <laughs> you know what the fuck's going on? That's like the nothing else matters video or some shit, right? It's just like what's going on? Something here. Leave it out, man. Damn it. In the background, it's gone. <laughs> Fucking glad I kicked it up. Well done. Dave Mustaine is going, shit. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> you <I> lied. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, man. When the when the the for those of you who don't know, when the Black Album came out, I was like, ah, oh, you know, it's okay. I I can deal with it. <laughs> I can deal with it. But then you look at what Megadeth put out on the same token. It was like, ooh, <laughs> ooh. Yeah, well, it's like yeah, Cone Dunk yeah. or something, wasn't it? Cone Dunk, you made yeah. when the Black Album came out. Yeah, yeah, I know. Check the dust. Yeah, that's like, like nah. Metallica stuff. I mean, even the, the new stuff, people are like, oh, it's back to the it's old not. school. I'm like, no, it's not. Like, James, James Huffman needs to stop saying baby every two months. Well, he Fuck had to off. replace oh. Yeah, Yeah with something, didn't he? I mean... Last well, true. Sorry, no, 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 but but I, I saw them... The first time I saw them live here in Australia, Metallica, it was like, you know, finally they came out. This was for justice for all. And um, there was a riot outside of the venue here in Australia. Hey, forgive us, we're a small place. <laughs> like, we, we had a riot... But fuck every song is just like yeah yeah you want some more beer? I'm like aren't you an aren't you an alcoholic? Oh yeah, it was that like the one that just played by themselves? <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the Justice tour and I seen them on the Black <laughs> Album tour and it was night and day because when I seen them on the Black Album tour, the, their egos were so big there was no support band. There was a film about them. I was like, what the fuck? And then they came on and played for three fucking hours. I left. I walked out. It's like, Jesus Christ. Four and so was yeah, later. Uh, my that. last bash on Metallica, I had tickets uh, for them and I was in the snake pit. And I thought it was going to be really cool. But do you know what I saw the most, the the best, well, not the best view, the most, the most consistent view I saw was when Lars jumped off his drum kit and was handing out drumsticks in his spandex pants and he bent over right in front of me to hand sticks to someone else over the other side and his ass was in my face in spandex pants and that's all I can remember from the gig was Lazaric in spandex pants with his, with his sweaty, <laughs> yeah, the, the sweat patch around his date hole. <laughs> I was like, no. No. <laughs> Yeah, that was for playing the slow songs, you know what I mean? <laughs> fucking hell. Well, I see fucking Magadeth on the Sephora so what tour, and I shouldn't have really been there because I think it was only third or fourteen. But that was the fucking gig that Dave Mustaine decided to fucking shoot his mouth off of. It was in Belfast, and they had to get us escorted from the fucking venue in like armored oh, army fucking trucks because Mustaine was going to get fucking killed. And he, like, shouted something about... He was a stupid fucker because he was like, I don't know if anybody knows this story. There was... You remember you used to get, like, tight selling bootleg T-shirts I'd say Gigs, not the official stuff. Well, they were selling, like, bootlegs, but he came out and started giving off to them, giving off Irish for shouting. <laughs> so uh, they told him it was for the cause. And he was like, oh, fucker. So he gets into the fucking gig, pissed off his face, and he's like, you know, this one's for the cause. And they played Anarchy in the UK, and it was a fucking riot. Jesus Christ. And I was like 14, dweeby wee kid going, what the fuck? <laughs> the whole place exploded. Uh, thank though. you so much, Cy Effin for the kind super chat. says, the swear jar isn't going to top up itself. Happy New Year, everybody. Thank you, Cy. <laughs> fucking right. <laughs> Fuck oath. Um, you know, that tour, the So Far So Good, So What, that Megadeth were booked to play here in Australia. I had tickets. I was about the same age as you. Um, it was an all-ages gig, so that was cool. And they cancelled like a week before because Dave Mustaine uh, apparently fell off the stage in Japan. Uh, but we all know what was going on. It was heroin. <laughs> yeah. It was absolutely yeah, heroin. Was. Jesus yeah, Christ, it was, it was always heroin. That's, that was, that's how you finish sentences in the fucking late 80s. Dave was saying, dot, 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 heroin. Because then, remember when he came back after all that? <laughs> because he used to wear the black sweatbands. And then when he came back after the, he said he was clean, everything was white sweatbands. And it was like, oh, yeah, man. Yeah, white sweatbands. No For sure. Oh, he's clean now because he's got white <laughs> sweatbands. <laughs> yeah, well done. That lasted, what, about fucking three minutes? As soon as Rust and Peace made money, he was out of his fucking tits. <laughs> he was just constantly like, like ah! fucking rocking his tits off. It's great. All right, so let's let's uh, we've had a bitch about metal and Metallica. Um, let's talk about when, when. What was your first guitar? How did you uh, attain your first guitar? The first guitar was that that one that my mother and my father bought me on 
Christmas Eve when I was 14, and it was, all I can tell you, it was a Yamaha. I had one pickup, which is all you fucking need, <laughs> Guitar Theory fans, let's, let's face it. You had one pickup, and it was like an RGX 110. It was proper like fucking Def Leppard guitar. It was like white with like a black neck. So that I had to rectify that. I got that spray painted black. But that was the first guitar that I got. And I had a really shitty Boss distortion pedal. Which one? Wasn't it the what normal air was the uh, it wasn't the boss one. I, I stepped up to the boss distortion, the yellow one. I originally had the <laughs> fuck we've talked about this before. The fluorescent pink DOD American metal. <laughs> that pedal. Jesus Christ. Although when you were a kid, you were like, this is the fucking balls. You know, granted, I was playing it through a stereo, but didn't have an arm. So I was like, it's awesome. It's like fucking great. It's totally stinking. But yeah, that was the first so, guitar. You mentioned about lessons. I'm gathering you didn't have lessons. And well, how did you? How did you get to this? Like, how did you get? How did you start riffing, man? <laughs> Fuck. Probably much like everybody else. Well, what I did, to be honest, I sat in my room, and my ma. Not that she's here, so she won't be able to climb. <laughs> but I'll say my ma would be able to climb. I used to go to school, and I'd come home. And from I got home from school, I would just play the guitar until I went to bed. And I did that for years. And that's how I learned, just by playing back tapes, putting back records. I mean, I had no understanding of tuning or anything like that. I mean, you would probably wow. say I still don't. We can talk and about so that. I, to be fair. But it was like, at the, <laughs> <laughs> at the time, you know, I told you like the other day. I mean, I was that fucking stupid. But not stupid, but naive to it. Didn't really, you know, I would like play, learn to play songs and I would write or draw little diagrams of where the machine heads were, you know, for the song. Didn't realize that when you changed your strings, you know, it wouldn't be in the same place. <laughs> so when I put them back in the same place, I was like, this sounds like dog shit. What the fuck's going on? It must be the pedal. <laughs> but it wasn't it was me. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, that's what I did. I just sat like as a kid for ages. I mean, I joined my first band when I was 16. And it, it was like a covers band, but the guys that was in the band with were like in their 20s. I think they were in their early 20s. And it was all like thrash metal stuff. It was dedicated to like Exodus and Annihilator and Anthrax and shit like that. So, yeah, it was just practice, practice, practice. That's that's the only thing that really helped me. Be, uh, well, let's play a song and we'll come back. I'm going to talk more about chugging because chugging's an important thing. <laughs> and meanwhile... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, we'll get ch get the chugging over here because fuck, man, I can feel this scotch already. Fucking hell, yeah, I know. <laughs> this was half scotch, half uh, ginger ale. Jesus Christ, why am I doing this at eight a.m.? I know because it's good for me. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna yeah, play yeah. um because I'm gonna play a few songs today because you know uh, miraculously your songs are really short so I can get away with playing each of them. So, I'm going to play Fortunate Son, and then when we come back, you can tell us about it, and then we'll say hello to everyone in the chat. Oh. So, folks, this is Metal Shack, Fortunate oh. Son. Are you ready? Let's do this shit. Boom! Yeah! In a sec, let me just do this. <laughs> I'm a pro, man. You ready? Let's go! Boom! <laughs> I've seen horrors, horrors that you've seen. But you have no right to call me a murderer. You have a right to kill me. You have a right to do that. But you have no right to judge me. It's impossible through words to describe what is necessary to those who do not know what horror means.
Now, I wouldn't normally play a cover on the show, but uh, I know uh, because that's been changed enough that I'm not going to get a copyright claim on it, <laughs> most likely. <laughs> so, did you get one? Oh, there you go. No, then it's all good. No, I didn't know. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, let's say hello to folks, and then we'll come back and talk about that. So I'm going to run through some names. Thank you all for being here today. Sorry I haven't reached out and said hello to you yet. Uh, Dave Fox, Kim Harden Hudson, Saga Kadabra, Joe Glenn, Gary Hubs. Uh, hey, thanks, Gary Hubs, for a super chat. What's going on, Gary? Gary Hubs has given us a super chat. Look at that. Let me put it up on the screen. There we go. Remember this moment, folks. Gary Hubs has sent us in a super chat. It's <laughs> it's a snapshot in time. There you go. Thank you so much, Gary Hubs. Thank you. I'm, keep it up. I'm just going to screenshot yeah. that one second. <laughs> Get a screenshot right now. <laughs> Thank you also to Dean, who, who super chat us. Dean Thomas as well. There you go. For the swear jar. Um, Dr. Zorders, I think I've mentioned as well. Ed B. Joe Glenn. Sean Chandler. I mean, there's so many of you here. Uh, Sith Vasquez. Uh, uh, let me see. Let me scroll up. Uh, Lou Reality Arts. Uh, let's see who else we've got here. Uh, Cy Effing, good to see you. Um, there's so many of you here, and I've, I'm trying to scroll and, and catch you with my poor eyesight. And I'll do my best as I scroll up. I know there's lots of people I've missed, but the people who are typing in the chat. Who's uh, Gregory O'Sullivan? Hello to you. Uh, good to see you, my friend. And uh, John Frank Songs, thanks for being here as well. Uh, Bear is here as well. Paying to get. I can't do the sound effects today uh, because of the situation with uh, doing interviews. Hambo Hounslow. I have an idea. Uh, so many of you. Thank you all. If it, just just throw it, throw a comment in the chat at the bottom of the screen so I can reach you and I will because uh, I'm scrolling up desperately now trying to find people now. But thank you all so, 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 so much for being here on New Year's Eve. Yeah, for most of you around the world. Uh, so what, what prompted you to do that cover, Kev? Um, I've always liked that song. I like the simplicity of it. I like the message of it, which obviously was written at a time that was relevant to what was going on. But I think the message of it is relevant as much now as it was then. Um, more no matter what, it's relevant for that. And so 
without getting too political about it. And again, as we've talked about, especially where I grew up. Um, I also just fancy doing the cover version because um, sometimes you blow out the cobwebs. And I think it was after I'd been in the accident with a fire. Um, and when I got my bandages off, it was sort of still breaking into my, back into my riff hand. So I thought this will be easy. And I just wanted to, to do the, a cover, but not something that was obvious. You know what I mean? Um, so that was the thought behind it. I think it did that after the acoustic thing. Fuck, I don't know. I don't know when the fuck I done it, to be honest. But that was the point of it. I've always, I've always liked the fucking song. You know, I lose track. It's like when I send you albums, you're like, fuck off, Kev. Stop sending me a shit. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that was the thought process behind it. I think it's a really great song. I love simple melodies. And I love simple classic rock songs. I mean, I've got a real uh, soft spot. I was going to say hard on. You can say <laughs> soft spot. I know you like hard ones. ons as well. I was, but I wasn't going to. I didn't want to lower it. Yeah, all. come on. <laughs> so, we haven't talked about pedophiles yet, so <laughs> it's pretty oh, rude. That's that. true. <laughs> so yeah, that was, it. And, and I enjoyed doing it. Also. I wanted to make it a more balls to the walk because you know I don't like singing. But when I do sing, I mean, I'm a total Dickinson, you know, fan, a Halford fan, and I like to go between yeah. those ranges as much as I like screaming. Um, so, yeah, I really enjoyed that, ch- that tune. It was, it was good crack. Unfortunate that I shut my YouTube channel down. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's go. a... <laughs> it's it's back, back up, up now. now. We'll, 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 we'll get, get into that. So, chugging, man. So, well, you, you got your first guitar. Uh, and I, I've talked about this on shows before. Um, when, when I got my first guitar, I knew nothing. and I never took lessons. Uh, when I did take lessons, I got incredibly frustrated, always by the people who were teaching me, that I thought they were fucking wankers. And I thought, and I would come away going, but why am I trying to learn to be like this person? Shouldn't I be trying to create my own style of guitar play. Uh, and so I used to run around the backyard with a, a, my first Onyx electric guitar, not plugged in, thrashing out to Anthrax and Metallica, pretending I was on stage like kids do, like, you know, at the fucking 13 years old, going, yeah, man. And, and I think uh, that helped me with my chugging hand because even though I was playing nothing up here, I was going dun 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 dun, dun, and I was learning how to gallop and do all those things that are important. What was the thing? How did you get your chugging hand to chug? Well, that was the benefit of of so many metal tunes being written in open E. But you just had to work on that chug hand first of all, and then worry about the complicated bit afterwards. I mean, I completely agree with you. I mean, I never had lessons because there wasn't that many people to give you lessons where I lived, and if there were. It was like classical guitar lessons, and you're like, fuck off, what classical guitar are we talking about? So they would teach you like theory, and you know you're just going to spend thousands for two years of theory. So to me, it just made more sense to to just practice myself and listen in the room. And that's exactly how I got the chug and hand. So it was mixing it up from Maiden, because Maiden didn't have a lot of chugs for, for the day that had been quite yeah. intricate. So learning that side of melody was was good for me certainly beneficial for me certainly something that i incorporate now which is obvious uh but it was as you get into the more extreme side of things the heavier side of things you just had to get that chug in hand and to me it was always important to have the down picking you know never like the half ass it and fake it and do the you know the whatever the other one's called <laughs> you know, the down picking, whatever the other one's called where you go down up, picking down. is the so only down, way you know, down thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only way exactly and you're like because it doesn't sound right if you do it the other way yeah. I was like it doesn't sound right so I just sat and practiced that and the, the, the chug hand just improved it sounds like striper massively. if you do it the other way probably better now than it was then <laughs> oh yeah that's one of their albums <laughs> non down picking leads you to hell uh, <laughs> I saw Ingve <laughs> Malmsteen at a, a guitar clinic unfortunately when I was young at the corner hotel and I swear to God, I would have rather have two old men ejaculate into my face. It was so terrible. <laughs> <Just>. <laughs> well, I had a cat my gear and just had the jizz, you know, but I still, I wouldn't have sold my gear, but I'd have the jizz. What the fuck? Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> 
getting started. Though. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I I, to... Hey, we've got a swear jar going. It's all good. Hello, Adam Burse, who's joined us, set up by Marshall as well. We've got some more metalheads joining us. Um, <laughs> there you go. So, your first band. How did that? How did that come about? My first band was the band I mentioned earlier when I was sixteen, and it was the aptly titled "Heavy Metal Name of Infiltrator," oh, which also sounds sexy. <laughs> Infiltrator, Infiltrator, and it was with, uh, like I say, a couple of local guys that were older than me. I used to go watch their band practice, and I was watching some of the guitar players, and I was like, I can fucking play the guitar better than that guy. Uh, and then it just happened to say, oh, do you need a guitar player? And they were like, no. And I was like, well, you, you do. <laughs> Unbeknownst to you, you do. And uh, that was the first band that I got into. And my mum was quite worried about it because at that time, there was no like underage gigs. And because those guys were all, you know, in their 20s, as I've said, it was all pubs that you played in. So I always had the bullshit. And like, you had one of them bum fluff moustaches. And I don't know how many guys out there ever done this. And you got your mum's mascara to darken it so you looked over what <laughs> and you fucking, brilliant yeah yeah you used to do that to make me look yeah you used to have to do that to be older so they'd let me into the fucking bed <laughs> used to play and you could just tell because my mum wore blue mascara so they were like that's who's got a blue patch what's going on <laughs> and I was like fucking magnum you, wo- you know giving all this shit like yeah, you were woke before the term was even fucking <laughs> <laughs> blue hair, oh, man. I'll tell you what, that fucking metal, they didn't even bring it up. It's just like, that dude's got a blue touch. <laughs> let him in. Right, in you so go. In you go. go. <laughs> we don't yeah, need your it. ID. <laughs> it's like, you don't need to see, you don't need to see my yeah. identification. You, these aren't the droids you're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's what it was. I think it hypnotized my Matash love. So that was good. And we played like, I mean, we're, we were fucking awful. We had, like, like I said, we've done like Iron Maiden songs. Sepultura, Annihilator, that no one ever oh, attempted, it but it was badass. <laughs> exactly. It was great. But we, had, we also done Iron Maiden songs, so we've done Ace is High and Hollow Be Thy Name. And our singer had a deeper oh, God. voice than me. So so when you attempt, and fair fucks to me, give it a go, like, but it sounded more like a Barry White doing Iron Maiden. So... There goes the iron. <laughs> but he's like, you know, you don't give a fuck. You're just headbanging like a lunatic. <laughs> so that lasted about a year. And then I think because the guys were a bit older, they were in that sort of period where they're, you know, that bullshit saying that people have where you grow out of metal, which I never understood. So some of the guys were growing out of metal and they were getting into other things, which is fine. But it only lasted about a year. Like, that was my first band, Infiltrators. Fucking kick ass. And, and since then, too, like, you, you ain't been no sledge. You've, you've been in bands and, and done some serious touring as well, yeah? Yes. When, when I lived back in Ireland before I moved, before Emily kidnapped me over to England, as my <laughs> mum likes to put it. Uh, yeah, we were, I mean, when I was in a band for about 10 years and we'd done loads of gigs. Um, it was me and my brother, uh, Tom, and We've done loads of gigs around Ireland, and then that led to getting over to America and playing some of those South by Southwest festivals. We did that. Then we played in Canada. We played over in England. So it was quite... I mean, there were a lot of bands around at the time, but we were always one of these bands that were like, well, we want to get out, you know, we want to try and make an effort to play. So outside of the country that we're from. So it ended up costing us more than what we made, but it was worth it. Because you just got that buzz. I mean, we were four, four guys from a fucking tiny fucking town in Ireland. You know what I mean? And next thing you know, you're playing over in the states, and you know we, we did it for like a week, doubling around. It was just for one gig in the states at that festival, but it was great. It was great apart from the fact that when we got there, it was a shoe shop. That was fucking disappointing. You, ne- you never told me. You know that what I mean? Before. And I still. Have... <laughs> no. no, no. It was a shoe shop, but I still had those images alive after death in my head. And I was like, what the fuck? It's a fucking shoe shop. <laughs> but it still had all the shoes in it. And we were like, we thought we were lost. And we were like, is this the fucking right place? And the guys were like, oh, no, no, this, the, the gigs tonight, you know, we'll take out all the shoes and remove all the shelves. And like, we are all right. You know, it was fucked up. We were like, we just flew fucking 6,000 miles, man, or whatever the fuck it was. <laughs> you know? So it was crazy. And they were like, do you need anything? And I was like, well, look, per se, it's tense. You know, what do we pint. do with this giant Eddie thing that we bought? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
exactly. Exactly. We've got, we've got an actual mummy that we brought all the way from fucking Ireland. Where do we put it? Can put it over here beside the Audi now. I didn't realise that before. That's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. We stopped, we stopped the fucking a cop um, down for instructions, but he was... He was, he was like a plain clothes cop, and he was obviously arresting somebody, which we didn't realize. We thought they were having friendly banter. Because when you're kicking somebody about the street in Ireland, that's just friendly banter. But this police was probably giving them a fucking hiding. And we were like, excuse me, could you tell me? He was like, you don't want to speak to me right now, brother. And he was like dressed out like fucking Sipowitz from NYPD Blue, <laughs> which was hilarious. <laughs> so we were like, all right. He grabbed the grab his gun and shit too. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> well, I know when I uh, when we became friends. I mean, I heard your music. Uh, uh, I can't exactly. I think it was through the Garage Band Users Group for the first time. I'm pretty sure it was there. Yeah, yeah. What you posted some music, thing? and I was like, because I'd been in that group for like fucking. It feels like donkeys years now, and would always be man. This this fuck all metal here. This fuck all like. I always felt like there was not a lot of people for me to uh, chat with and talk about metal, and then you popped up. And it was like, oh, all right. Well, maybe this guy's all right. And it, and you know, it, t- it turned out to be absolutely true. But there's more. Uh, I want to touch on this too because a lot of people, and I, I, fa- I deal with this as well. Being a metalhead and producing metal, you get lumped into the category of just being a metalhead. When I know both of us are so much more than that. Like we do like lots of styles of music and we do try to incorporate it into metal if you if you're if you're only listening to metal i think you you're limiting yourself as a metal musician uh because some of the greatest metal that is around is based on classical music firstly and so much more um so so what are the other influences that you have like you apply to your metal music I mean, it, it would be really po-faced of me to say that I try to bring other influences to map to the the heavy stuff that I do. I mean, I do listen to a lot of different styles of music. I mean, I'm a big fan of like Southern rock, like classic, like Southern rock, um, hence the cover. Uh, I'm a big fan of like acoustic based music. I'm a big fan of like Damien Rice. I like him. Um, there's a couple of, there's a classic rock guy called Robert Johnson and the rock, a really, really good band. But I think it's important to try and incorporate all those things in. It's like the difference between Metal Shack and Desir to our ears are very different. Some people who aren't versed in metal, they're not, which is fair enough. And I completely what you mentioned there as well about you started to join these groups. Because, I mean, I, I mean, I'm not the most forgiven person in the world. And if people are fucking dickheads, I'm like, fuck you. You know what I mean? I'm not interested. But when you go into like groups, community groups, and it's meant to be communal. And it transpires, not to mention any names, but it transpires those groups just really, you know, dickhead desktop engineers that always have something to say, even when you're not asking for their opinion. Um, that narrow-mindedness is not something that I expected to see. Granted, it's very, very few and far between. Um, but I think those people, unfortunately, still exist. And they, they don't see the bigger picture, you're right. They don't see the influences that even the most extreme metal song might have. I mean, you could sit and listen to anything from Carcass to Out the Gates, and you can hear all influences, not just metal, if you're a, a broad music fan. Um, but yeah, I don't think... It's, if I do try to bring it in, it's not consciously. I mean, it's, you know, it's guitar solos, it's riffs, it's drums. It's like I always say, it's metal growing. But deck, it's not fucking that complicated um, to me. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, I mean, there's other things like the acoustic stuff and things that have done. I mean, I mean other influences are probably more apparent in that in that sort of uh, release of, or those releases that have done there. But to me, it's just all about. It's still always about the song. I mean, a lot of my stuff's very melodic, even the deceit stuff when it's heavy. It's it's just darkly melodic and a lot like. Like, say, like Thomas uh, Galean, for example, when when you listen to Thomas's music, you can hear like his like influences like Radiohead and things like that. And I love like Radiohead, and I like to to bring that dark melody into into the, the heavy stuff. So it might not be as obvious, you know. So people might think, oh well, this is like just sounds like fucking whatever Metallica. Well, 
hopefully not Metallica, but whatever. That, that unfortunately, that's people's age what metal is. Um, but yeah, I think I probably do take the darkly melodic stuff more from external influences outside of metal, specifically like Radiohead or you know some darker Neil Young and that sort of. Thing. I want to, all right, so we'll touch on this and we'll jump into another song because I want to play some of your music from the Begin Again EP. Um, I, I see it all the time as well. Like, and it's been a consistent being a metalhead that people have looked down on metal like it's some kind of, either you have the extremes, you have, it's satanic and you're going to hell. Or then you get it from, I think, musicians who go, no, oh, it's just metal, like talentless shit. Like, it's not like what I'm doing over here. Uh, and and I've seen it in the groups too, where people do look at you and think, wow, oh, you're just a metalhead. What the fuck would you know? And, uh, you know, there's been times where I've had to block people on, on... I used to fight with people over it and it's not worth it anymore because it just shows their character that they're not willing to uh, look into other styles. Oh, my God. Well, uh, <laughs> well I'm... I 100% agree. And I mean, you know, I yeah. agree with that. You know, I agree with that. But th that's just noise. You know, those are just people that don't know what the fuck they're talking about. Anybody with any musical sense about them at all, anybody who has the balls to call themselves a musician, knows that metal guys, metal players, metal chicks, whoever the fuck it is, all metal players are some of the most talented players you fucking find. Because metal folks can play a metal, but they can play it numerous other things very very rarely does it work the other way i've never come across a pop star that's released a fucking slayer cover version of it. it's been shit they probably use garage band loops to fucking do it <laughs> yeah uh, the the common thing as a metal singer myself over the years i always hear people say but why don't you sing we can't understand what you're saying. I always say back to them, you don't want to hear what I'm saying when I'm growling, motherfucker. All right? Because it's not good. It's probably about digging up your mum's corpse, okay? And fucking it right in front of you. So it's best I don't do that. But when I am singing, you'll understand, you know, because I'll make sure you know I can sing better than you and your entire family and entire bloodline. So shut the fuck up. Um, but that also seems like a remedial question to me for people to ask that. You know, why don't you sing? I mean... M music, no matter what it is, is all yep. about emotion. So if you've got a fucking extremely heavy song, I mean, that dictates a fucking certain way of presenting your vocals. Do you know what I mean? And it, and it also dictates a certain lyrical content that's just not purposeful the majority of the time. It just brings it out of you. So for somebody to say, like, why aren't you singing on that? You know, that, that's just a fucking bullshit. That's like my response would always be, well, why don't you fuck <laughs> off? You know what I mean? What the fuck? Like, so stupid. Yeah, yeah, I never understood why somebody would, if the song's called like digging up your corpse and fucking it, I don't know why you want to hear me singing it like digging up your corpse and fucking it. Like, there's a time and a place for those kind of vocals. But if I am <laughs> literally with a shovel in hand digging up the bones of your your mother and I'm about to have sex with it, I think I'm going to sing it. Digging up your corpse and you know I'm going to be angry about it. Because, like, by if uh, yeah. it, it, but maybe you've harmonized on that. <laughs> yeah. D minor, D, D minor. Yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm probably, I think I'm going to be angry about it because I'm an, I'm an incel and I'm having to dig up a corpse to do it. So, of course, I'm going to be angry. You know. Yeah. <laughs> And then when you're doing the groceries, it's not like you're like, I'm going to screw this up a grocery. <laughs> I don't know, I do that. <laughs> or depending, depending on how full the shelves are. I do that all the time. Where is the dry ginger ale, you motherfucker? <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck do you mean you've only got oat milk? <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's play a song. And uh, I might go and fill up my glass because I've just finished my first booze. This is, now I don't have a video clip for this. This is uh, Broken Bones. It is from your Begin Again EP from Metal Shack. And uh, let's bang this out and then we'll have a talk about it afterwards. So let me mute you and we'll see you all back here within 3 minutes 30. Metal. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> look at that. 
Wow, we just had a we just had a crash there from uh, the uh, music app. Let's fix that, and hopefully it'll play. There we go. Broken Bones, Metal Shack, much more than meets the eye. Let me uh, make sure you're back in the vocal. There we are. Tell us about this EP, this Born Again EP, Kev. Yeah, that was directly after I had the accident with the fire. And it was, hell, as you know, you and Sai and anybody else and, and Dave. <laughs> well... Uh, it was after that, so I was bandaged up for fucking. I mean, my hands were bandaged for about four, three or four weeks. I was so fucking frustrating. I mean, proper like Iron Maiden, Egyptian like bandage, and uh, it, he just couldn't do anything. And when he came out of that, it was like for anybody who doesn't know what I'd end up in a fire, the burn, I burnt myself, and my hands were all fucked up, and the foot's still a bit fucked up. It looks like fucking. You know, one of the chicks from the Golden Girl. But yeah, uh, it was fucking. <laughs> that's just a thought. <laughs> that's, that's how I ended up doing the acoustic thing. Sorry. Which one? <laughs> yeah, and that was just to ease myself. Oh, the, fucking, the one that looks like a foot. Which one's that? <laughs> Which one's that? <laughs> the one that looks like a bird foot. But, um, 
Yeah, so that was that was my way of easing myself back in because I couldn't bend my hand because it was all like scarred up and burned, and I had to wait till those came off, and that was the easiest way to get back in. So that was the thing about doing the acoustic stuff. But anyway, I like to do acoustic stuff. I find that it, if you're a bit stuck with the riffs, if you just take a wee break away from it and do something. Hello. 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 Yeah, are you still there? I'm still here. I Your think my head's died. Well, I'm the well, thing's died. You've still got sound, so that's okay. I've got, I've got another one. <laughs> yeah, I've got two. So, yeah, so that was what happened with all that. And to take that step away from metal and a wee bit of an acoustic sort of session. Um, but it worked out well. I was quite pleased with that. Um, it was quite, it also was from a, engineering point of view if i can be one of them desktop engineer pricks it helps you fucking you know understand your engineering a wee bit better and to get those live sounds you know and less processed and i think i was quite happy with how it came out yeah looking to give a bit of backstory about uh kev's accident so you probably heard it a couple of times so he actually that was what to talk what's about that? <laughs> I was going to talk about it. Got PTSD. Well, it's my fault, isn't it? <laughs> so you keep telling me, <laughs> because well, basically, um, he bought one of my t-shirts, one of my uh, tank tops from Teespring for you. <laughs> a hoodie, yeah. Heard. And he stood by a campfire, and it caught on fire, and he's he went up on smoke. He went up in flames faster than James Hetfield over a um, failed t- pyrotechnic. Well. <laughs> have a bit of context there. So I was also wearing a, a pair of, sh- I just came out of the shower and I was wearing a pair of shorts and the shorts were like made in, you know, a tent in India and they didn't go on fire. But Jesus, <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> Jesus <laughs> overpriced, pissy smelling fucking hoodie that I bought. <laughs> that went up like fucking a petrol bomb. I was just like, Jesus. And the whole fucking lot. And then I, uh, the shorts also caught on fire. But that's because a piece of oh, G2 attached to the shorts. <laughs> this story gets more wild each yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, that was it. And then I was listening to fucking Metheist at the same time. And then the CD player blew up. <laughs> CD it's all, player. It's all oh, my fuck. fault. It's Metheist's oh. fault. Don't buy the Metheist hoodies yeah. on my store. Yeah. <laughs> You'll die in them. And then M come running out, and M says, "What's wrong, Jade?" She said, "I mean, Kev, what's wrong?" <laughs> it is confusing. So, um, that... but yeah, so that was a fucking story. It was that, great. Thanks that, for bringing up that. Right. I, I knew you'd love it. You know, that's why you've got the metal straw there to get you through. So, um, so I want to just touch on. Let's go back here. That particular album there has. Uh, some Ross and just read what Ross wrote. Let's face it, you shit at fire. <laughs> no, fuck. Just <laughs> no, you're fucking right. Just remember, right. Ross is the handyman at the moment because he's broken his hand, and uh, just this, everything we say is about his hand. So uh, why don't you uh, fuck off, Ross? So this album cover too. <laughs> now we've talked about uh, we've heard the mm. name M come up a couple of times. So you you are married. Mm. To the wonderful M. That's her on the album cover, isn't it? Isn't it? I thought it was her. No, but I picked. I, no, I picked that oh, photograph. I'm so. Because it looks like <laughs> well, you fooled me. But. But you wanted to see the text. How could you tell the time? <laughs> oh man. I'm so sorry, M. How could you tell? <laughs> I didn't bring up your tits. I swear. It's all on video. <laughs> Um, oh God, man! Now I'm losing it. But so you said you took, you... but that's right. why I picked that. Be... That's why I picked that because I thought, oh, this looks a bit like M from behind. I don't like the the open space of the, of the photograph itself. Yeah, it does. It, it fooled well. me. So there you go. Um, <laughs> there's Emily's in the chat. Oh, <laughs> awesome. But I want to talk about that because you said well, you yeah. took some time off from playing music. Uh, for for uh, and and that mm, long time. is that because of your family? You started a family. Tell us a bit about that because you have an amazing family. Emily's a beautiful human being, and you have two awesome, amazing kids. Which uh, you know, uh, you want to tell us a, a bit about that? 
Yeah. Um, Jack and Matthew. Jack's 13 and Matthew's 9. Um, so, I mean, it was just like everybody. It isn't that remarkable a reason, but whenever you have kids, you just have less time. And I mean, obviously, I'd moved over from Ireland here. So you're sort of starting new with to get a, you know, a house and new jobs and things like that. So you've got to prioritize. I know some people still try and live that fucking whiskey, a go-go dream, but I was a bit more realistic. Uh, yeah, so then Jack was born and then Matthew was born. And then when Matthew was three, he was diagnosed with autism. So it takes a huge amount of her time, especially at the start. I mean, it's nowhere near. Now he's nine and he's learning to adapt it as best he can and we're used to his ways. Um, so it was about a year ago that you know what it's like. Um, there's a creative bug. If you're a creative person and you can't get it out, you start to go a bit yeah. mental. And I think it was starting to get to me a bit. So it was because we couldn't do any filming with the whole COVID thing, because that was the other creative outlet that I had when it was it. Um, so but COVID kicked in, that's when I got back into it. But yeah, I mean, it was just my kids and, and getting married and just dealing with everyday life. It was, you just didn't have time. You know, you were just fucking knackered. But realistically, you've got to make that time. And I think I'm making up for it now. Well, I'm very lucky because I've got to know you and your family as as because we're mates, you know, and, and I love you guys so much. Um, and uh, for those who aren't privileged enough to be on Kev's Facebook, because you've got to be, trust me, because you won't last long. <laughs> but um, That's fucking appreciate absolutely. I heard a song last week where uh, Matthew sung some metal vocals over one of your tracks, which was, I don't know why you've got me in this year. <laughs> to be honest. You'd probably get the album finished faster with Matthew. <laughs> Oh, that's oh, definitely. <laughs> well, that, that was an interesting thing as well because Matthew's Matthew's autism is uh, yep. sensory, so it's like a lot of a lot of sound related. But it's you say things like that, and people expect it to be like you know, and like loud noise and things like that. It doesn't work that way. I mean, he could be freaked out by a, a mouse farting, but he loves like Judas Priest, so he can sit with like headphones on. He loves like Man of War and shit like that, and that's not for me tying him in his room and whipping him and making him he just likes it himself so i was like jamming i think it's last week it's jamming and he just said daddy can i sing i was like of course you can get in i would fucking go and he just started to sing a song about lord of the rings which was the song narsil's power which is going to be kept the name is being kept but he done a great job and it was a bit of a, a bit of a sort of light bold moment for me because I hmm, you know and knowing him as I do with his autism I was thinking that this could be a really good therapeutic thing for him so I mean he loves like Beyblade and things like that he loves loads of Japanese things and anybody knows anything about Japanese stuff there's always these like pop rock punky metal songs attached to them so I think we're, we're going to have a go and maybe do one of those but yeah it was cool I like what he done too. I was like, "Wow, you're like in time and everything, almost." If I played played it, would that be okay? You can play <laughs> awesome. it, yeah, of course. Because uh, M, 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 is that okay? I'll, I'll ask him. Yeah, I want to. Sometimes I'll just pull a thread and go with it, but because it's your your, your child, I'll, I'll I'll ask because I I think this is fucking awesome. To be honest, to you know. Um, to hear a child, no matter what spectrum of whatever they're on, just enjoying music is is fantastic in my book. So I'm, I'm going to flick over to this screen here, which might. There you awesome go. You said you can. Let's. Uh, I can do it this way. I think if I go to iPad Cam. Is this the one, or is there one with music? There's an eye then no, put off a clip of the music as well. <laughs> is this the one with music? Here it is, yeah. Here we go. Oh, that's it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it destroys everything you Yeah! 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 Yeah!
<laughs> nozzle power, man. I swear to God, that <laughs> nearly got me kicked out the band. Um, <laughs> it should have really. <laughs> we can hear his version. Oh, I'll bet it's much awful. better than mine. Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> no, but um, I... Yeah, well, yeah, and, and Matthew, if you do get to see this, you'll probably get the censored version, but uh, I, I think Matthew's an absolute legend, and um, I hope he finds the next ocarina that he needs to find. <laughs> oh, for sure. I'll show him this in the morning, he'll be buzzing, because he's always like, Doug, can I have a YouTube channel? <laughs> Doug, can I be on Jade's show? Can I get a subscriber? He'll be buzzing when they show him this. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I've created a monster now. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let me look at my list of stuff um, that I do have here. So h- how did Metal Shack happen? How did the idea behind Metal Shack happen? Because I love this story. Again, it was just going back to that, that that sort of creative, you know, niggling that you have. And I've got a shack at the top of my garage. And I didn't know anything about home recording at all. I didn't even know you could record, like, you know, on an iPad. No idea whatsoever until I bought my son an iPad, Jack. And then it, I was looking at it. I was like, what the fuck's this garage band shit? Even though I've had an iPhone for years, never even looked at it. Because I thought it was what it said it was. You know what I mean? I thought it was just, like, loops and all this sort of shit. But then when I delved into it, I went, hmm, right? Um, and then I got myself an interface, and I, I broke out the Gibson, and I went in the shack and just started picking up where I left off. And that's how Metal Shack was born, and it is named after exactly what it is, which is just a, a stinky shack full of lawnmowers <laughs> at the top of the garden. Uh, and, that, and that was it. And he just started, like, you know, we started, like, pumping out these songs. And the first the first stuff that it done was mediocre, recording-wise. It sounded pretty bad. But um, I started watching your show, and I started watching a bit of Pete's show to sort of get my head around the the setup with all the cables and shit like that. I was like, what the fuck goes where? Where's this go? How do I have kids? I have no idea. That's the story of my life. Where's this go? <laughs> I mean, that's how the shack started. So it was just me banging out tunes. And then I find some of those community groups that, that was spoke about. But yeah, I don't really think there was a lot of thought behind it. I never realized that these groups even existed. I mean, I didn't know there was channels like yours, channels like Pete's. I didn't know anything about it. Um, and I sort of stumbled upon it, just searching as you do. But that's sort of how the shack became the shack. Well, that's how I found you too, as a musician. I, I've, I found your music on the Garage Band <clears throat> user group, and you were recording videos in the shack. And the shack used to be this thing that was like, that's where you went out outside to record vocals, where you could freely go and do all that stuff, and not and not like offend people. <laughs> I guess is that the term? <laughs> not to their yeah, face. Not to their no, face. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the garden was long enough that it was, you know, out of the house because it's quite a, a loud voice. So if I go full fucking Halford, wouldn't be good. But it was great in the shack. But then, of course, yeah. winter kicked in, and that was the fucking killer. Because it's just like nah, it's getting like minus eight, minus ten. And you're just trying to play the guitar, and then you're trying to sing, and your voice is fucked. And to be honest, you, you were the godsend. Because I'd left all those groups because of the fucking dipshits we spoke about earlier. And I was like, fuck this, I can't be arsed with this shit. And I, I don't like singing. Even though I've always sang in bands, I don't like doing it. not a case of uh, not, not being capable. I just I don't like doing it. I prefer to play the guitar. Um, so yeah, I mean, I had to abandon the shack. To an extent. I mean, you, you fucking chewed my ass out when I said I was going to stop now with Shaq. And you're like, what the fuck are you talking about, you stupid <laughs> Irish fuck? I think you called me like a fucking a live aid victim and stuff. It was really weird. <laughs> I'm not that clever, yeah. man. So what are you going to do, buy tickets, tickets to fucking Dokken? You know? I'm not that like, clever. What? You made that up. <laughs> All right. 
but, I don't know but yeah, that, that was the first time I, I like I saw you too because you were posting videos in the shack, and I was like, "How cool is this? This guy's in his sh- his little outback shack, like a serial killer, but instead of murdering people, he's out there doing death metal vocals. I love this, and um, th- that's how I reached out to you, and was like, "Man, I I, I dig what you're doing." Um, Dr. Zorders writes, how many of us stumbled across GB, Googled, and then found Jade and Pete? Well, most people found Pete first. <laughs> you know, oh, I was the afterthought. But um, without Pete, I wouldn't be here. So, But um, uh, and I want to talk about the whole Metal Shack. Let's head to the Metal Shack to see kind of stuff, and then we'll play another song. Because when we started talking about collaborating and making music, um, you probably didn't think it would take so long for us to get stuff out. I, on the other hand, knew knew what I was dealing with with illness and knew how hard it is for me to finish things. And unfortunately, I wish that I could be the person I was and I'm not anymore, unfortunately. And I try so hard to put out the image that I can still sing like I used to. And I can't. Uh, my my body's fucked, my health is fucked, and I can't get out the things I need to do at the rate I want to do them. Um, so we had a discussion about you maintaining Metal Shack as, a, as an entity. And there was reason behind that because of my fear of knowing how my illness dominates my life and that I didn't want to stilt you in any way because you are such a prolific and amazing artist um and you know there was pushback from you i remember but i'm glad that you did continue to take it on because our desir album has taken all this time because of me it's my fault but it's not it's it's the illness that i deal with every day uh, i don't i don't think i don't think i think you've been on for on your, yourself i i think if you think back when we started talking about this year I mean, it was like a fucking, oh, do you have any songs? And coincidentally, I had written Spineless, which is kind of like heavier than the previous Metal Shack stuff. Not heavier, but it was, it was just more in a death metal thrash metal vein. And that was our intention. It was like, oh, and it's like, I've got this song. And then the more that we started, because that was really when we started to speak, which would have been December probably last year. And uh so the more that we started to talk, the more that we realized we got more in common. Enthusiasm yeah. got in the way. So you can't you can't doubt your enthusiasm at all. And it was our enthusiasm that went, fuck me, let's do an EP. And then it went, fuck me, let's do an album. You know what I mean? And then that turned into fucking three albums. <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, you give yourself a fucking hard time because I've always said to you, there's no fucking oh, rush. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter. It comes out when it comes out. And I know you're that person that wants to do it but after the while you, you you know you end up going right i need to fucking slow down and take my time which i've always been cool with but it was that metal enthusiasm that led us to that place of you thinking fuck me i've got to get this done despite me going shut the fuck up it doesn't matter <laughs> and the idea would be on going it's like yeah. next week it's like oh my god <laughs> no, like, you shut the fuck up stop telling people oh, jesus christ I've got, you know, my feeling on that. I've got absolutely no fucking beef for that. Yeah, one yeah. Word. And, and you know, and I'm sure people are waiting for it to come. And and you know, it's 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 gonna be, it's gonna be there really soon. You know, it, it, it's just it ha- the way it's turned out has has been. It's it's me trying to push as hard as I used to be able to push, and it was enthusiasm too, because I I think, you know, I think sometimes when you're dealing with illness, and I think you know you. you anybody who's who's dealing with illness you try to push through it and believe that you can still do what you used to be able to do and you and because that's what gets you up in the morning man that's what pushes you through to make you keep going if you don't have that drive you're fucked you'll fall into a hole and my drive has always been yeah i can do that i can do it but you know what it sometimes isn't the case with all the other stuff that i'm trying to do it isn't the case i'm lucky that not only do I have folks, and I will uh, say this 
I'm so glad I've got a platform to say this now. I'm lucky. Not only do I have such an amazing friend in Kev, because some of the conversations we have, you seriously don't want to hear. It's not meant for your ears. Um, but, you know, uh, and also a uh, friend, but such an amazing musician that he's created so many songs for me to be able to sing over that I'm so behind on. Um, and But I'm so glad that you've continued to have Metal Shack because... It's been awesome sitting on the sidelines, dealing with my own, you know, dark passenger, as I like to call it, that nagging voice that's trying to force you to get things done and you just can't sometimes. But to see you have your continue Metal Shack and have all these other shows play it and all these other people love Metal Shack because at least people have still got to hear you and hear your music while I've been floundering, you know. It's been awesome. Well, and I think it, it was important too, and I'm glad that you talked me. It's important to hopefully, the more that people do hear Metal Shack and the Seer, that hopefully people can tell the difference. And that for me is great because I'm like, well, as a musician, there's nothing better that if you can, much like the acoustic stuff, if you can separate that and you can go like, well, well that's Kev, this is Kev and Gia, and people get equally as much enjoyment out of it. To me, it doesn't matter if it's one to see your song, four to see your songs, three fucking to see your albums. It makes no difference. I'm not doing it for anybody else to hear it. I mean, at the end of the day, if people enjoy it, fucking great. I'm not doing it for that. I'm doing it for me and you. I'm doing it for me to write the music and for you yeah. to sing on. Because people turn around and say, well, you can sing on it. And I'm like, yeah, I can, but that's not the fucking point. You know, it's not the point of fucking me doing it. What the, it's, it's about what me and Gia bring. The, to the music it's not just what the fuck I, what I do or what Gia does it's not about that and it took people a while to get that in their fucking heads but I think they, they have and I think well, whenever this year comes out whenever it comes out uh, I hope they're going to get as much enjoyment out of it because it's another string to my bow it's another project for you to have in yours as well and I mean I just enjoy that collaboration I mean to be honest if this year never happened it wouldn't fucking make a difference to me. I'm, I'm not friends with you because we have a fucking bond. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you again. Uh, I have an idea for the second super chat. <laughs> and and da the typo. Four and eight and eight. What the fuck's your problem? Oh, <laughs> don't don't do that. <laughs> God. <laughs> and thank you, Dave, also for the happy new thank year, you. Dave Fox, for the super chat as well. And thank you all for being here today. Um, Look, it's. I think. Uh, I think anybody who's been in a virtual band, or even in a band where you're playing in a rehearsal studio, yeah, it's tough. You've got you, you've got personalities that clash. You've got, um, you know, there's there's all manner of things that happen within bands. No matter if it's virtually online or dealing with venues and all this kind of stuff. But uh, I think where we're very lucky um, is that the the first thing that we had before we started making music was and that we still have is these conversations about metal because the the one thing that is is our bond is that we we pretty much finish each other's sentences on if you send me a riff i go wow that sounds like carcass and you just go yeah man <laughs> that's exactly it you know that's exactly. that's a more exactly. angel kind of riff You've got to understand the people that you play music with, yeah? And uh, if, if you don't understand them, you're going to struggle to make music. It's going to be an ongoing push, pushing shit up, up a steep hill. So uh, out of everything, and this year will happen, folks, trust me. Um, it, it's just a blessing every day to be able to hang out and not the kind of blessing which involves a Catholic priest. Man, where am I going? <laughs> no, it is a... But but for me for me, it's where where that has led to. I mean that was the common ground. That was the the denominator that, that brought you together. But then, not only from musical taste, but then you find out you've got the same taste in comedy, the same taste in movies, the same taste in you know whatever is on YouTube, like half in the bag and shit like that. You know, there's just so many things that draw people together that makes it easier to be friends with people i mean like i'm not a social person i'm not someone that goes out looking for friends i mean i'm way too cynical to trust people but when you can't find that and you're comfortable enough to discuss anything or show them your wife's tits for example <laughs> then 
you know what I mean? Sorry, Em. That, that makes it, the music, the music, <laughs> I should not like it, they're cracking. But the fucking music side of things, it, it becomes secondary, you know? So it's like Anthony, I'm like, just get it fucking done when it's done. I'm not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere. And if people have listened to it, no matter when it comes out, if they want to hear it, they'll wait. Yeah, and it's going to be killer. And you know what? The awesome thing is, too, there's two other albums waiting in the wings. Uh, that's <laughs> Dude, you're so metal. Four now. Four there's, now. <laughs> uh, the thing about this, folks, being in a band with somebody who, before you've even got your first album out, has three other albums finished <laughs> waiting for vocals. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a very <laughs> rare situation. I've just stopped sending them. I'm like, I'm not going to send them anymore. I don't want to press you anymore. I'll just leave them where they are and we'll deal with it. So let's get it done. It's an amazing thing. So um, what I want to also touch on before, I want to talk about your film. And Yeah, no pressure. Size, size, there's no pressure at all. Um, I want to talk about your filmmaking too and then we'll play another song uh, because you are, an, you are a filmmaker. Tell us how you fell into that and... Uh, all about it, and I'll, and I'll play a clip from something that you've you've got here as well. Well, that was again the the creative bug that we talk about. I mean, I've always been into films. I've always been into horror films from when I was like five. I've seen like Halloween when I was five, uh, and that just really—I mean—it frightened me, but it frightened me in a good way, and it gave me a lifelong passion for much like music for film, but also like world film. And it led me to like Italian films, Japanese films. That's where it always my interest outside of just Western world movies. I'm not like a blockbuster <laughs> dude, really. Um, you know, but uh, yeah, it led me like to the point that I was like, when, when the Japanese movie Ring came out in Japan, I ended up paying like 80 quid for it to be shipped from fucking Japan because I mean, it didn't come out worldwide and that's certainly the western world for about five years after that but if anyone's seen ring when i bought it from this japanese guy he sent me it on a blank video cassette and i'm sure it was like a joke but i was like what the fuck you know it didn't have a name or anything it's just like he recorded it the way we spoke about we used to record albums in the day so he quit man i was like fucking hell he had quit for a cassette tape jesus anyway yeah so that I've always had this massive interest in film and then I was just working and I've always been quite creative writing, like stories and things like that. And I started putting a story down and I just thought to myself, I wouldn't mind making a movie. And much like, again, music, I, I'm sort of OCD that I have to know how things work. So I decided to go to film school. Um, and I, I was kind enough to let me do that because it was quite an upheaval for me to leave work and go go and get a degree. Um, so I went and did that for three years and I got my degree in film. And then I started working on many things, films, advertisements, music videos. But it's the worst fucking, the worst place to work, man. Yeah. It's full of wankers. Just all so disheartening. It's the only, it's the only job. Maybe I'd say the fucking music where they expect you to work for free for years. And when I was going kids, I was like, I'm not going to fucking work for free, man. I mean, I did it for a period of time, but they always had this, oh, you know, if you work for free, it'll give you experience. And you're sort of like, well, I've been doing this three years now. After getting a degree, how much fucking experience do you need, you know? So I moved away from that because it just it just wasn't worth it. With Matthew's situation, he would be away from home for periods of time. And uh, yeah, I stopped that. And then I went into teaching. And I was teaching film class to like students at a drama school. And that was just on the weekends again. A lot of things are dictated sort of our lifestyle, our life with, with the kids and things. So, I mean, that's how I ended up making films. I'm still made independent films. I still make my own films when you can get a chance. I've got scripts waiting to be shot, but the whole COVID but things just made it difficult and you know actors don't want to be out anywhere around people until they think they can be because they've got other jobs that they don't want to catch things but yeah i love it man. i love i love making films i love i love writing stories 
I like stories too. I'm going to play this teaser. You want to give us a bit of an intro to what this is that I'm about to play? This TM SPC trailer? Yes. This is a teaser for a film that I've written uh, yet to be shot called The Morning Star Preserves Company. And what this is about, the script is about an agreement thousands of years ago at the dawn of time between heaven and hell that hell will get the souls of bad folks, serial killers, blah, 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 and heaven gets the good guys. Um, but what heaven does is they use those souls and they turn them into jams and chutneys <laughs> to be sold on earth. Um, and part of those jams and chutneys are at, at by the devil to keep him at bay from getting mad at God. So that's why it's called the Morning Star Preserve Company because the Morning Star is also indeed, a name for the devil. Catholics, indeed. <laughs> so, this is it. Yeah, exactly. Let's see what happens. So, folks, kick back. I'm going to play this clip and we'll be back shortly. Enjoy. This is awesome. Ten minutes late, Nix. I know, I know, I'm sorry. Bit of a mix-up with songs this morning. Lunch? Yes, it's a cheese and pickle sandwich. That's one thing the humans got, right? Well, by all means, you can try some. Is it one of ours? Well, that's not very likely now, is it? <laughs> now, these additions will have to be approved. The boss will want to review the sins on this one. As expected. But I don't foresee any problems. She is definitely one of ours. Laura Kinsey. Well, Nix, always a pleasure. Same time again next week? Yep, same time. Oh, then. Yes. On time. Man of many talents. There we go. Let me uh, bring you back into the uh, sound here. There you go. Dude, um, it continuously blows me away at, at all of the fire stokers you have in the uh, in these little fire pits here. How talented you are, you know. Um, it definitely, uh, it blows me away. So I look uh, I look forward to, and, and you know, if you've seen any of uh, Kev's clips, they're, they're they always look amazing as well. Oh, look how camera's doing, gone for the fingers as well. I mean, that one. Hang on. Bye bye. There you are. I've got you back now. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's, it's just what, I mean, I appreciate that. Thank you. But, um, yeah, I mean, I've just got all this gear 
like filling gear up in the in the garage. So lucky enough, these things they don't cost a lot of money. They, they look more expensive than what than what they are. But I, I do hope to make that film because the, the actual story. I mean, that's the opening, which is they're talking about the character that the actual short film's about, who turns out to be a serial killer, not to spoil it. Um, and like a demon comes for it. And it's quite, it's quite, it's quite an exciting story. But I hope to get it shot. But it's like everything; these things aren't going anywhere, and you don't forget how to do it. So it's all good. Yeah, and it takes time. It, it takes time to to do this stuff and, and get this stuff happening. And and we don't have all the time in the world to do it all. Um, so, but uh, make sure now. I have got links in the description to Kev's channel. So make sure you go and subscribe. And like I say, subscribe if you're going to go and watch Kev's stuff. Don't subscribe if you don't give a shit, because it's kind of pointless. And that's kind of going to lead me into something else before we talk about how you make music. And then we'll wrap everything up. Um, what are your thoughts on, on subscriptions and people like uh, leaving comments and all this kind of stuff? Uh, let, let's talk about it because we do talk about it often and I think we can be candid about it. Um, it's a I, think, I think there's a world that everyone is going to be nice, which is fine. I think that's great. Everybody wants to be positive and shit. That's great. I, myself personally, I only ever comment on things that I like. Um, and I think that's the best way to do it because sometimes it can lead people. I mean, if you're constantly telling someone, this is great, this is awesome, this is amazing, you know, when a hundred people say it, and then you go to your YouTube channel and you've still got 10 subscribers. I question the, the, the genuineness of, of that sort of situation. Um, and I think a lot of that comes down to like fly by night people, you know, people that only come in to hear their own shit. And as soon as they hear their own stuff, the fuck off. And they don't really, they're not really, I don't deem that to be a community thing. Um, a lot of people in the community don't tend to do that to be fair. But you do get people that dip in that you've never seen and they're like, oh, this is fucking amazing. And they might post a fucking clip to their shit or something, you know, to promote it. And I think that's bad crack. Like, I think that's, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not on board with that. Shit like that fucks me off, to be honest. Um, so it's, it's, it baffles me. And I think from the conversations you and I have had, it baffles you to an extent as well. Um, you live more in the YouTube world, so you're able to understand it better than what I am. But yeah, that sort of behavior is weird to me. I'm still was like, what the fuck? Do you like it? If you like it, then like, it. you'll just dip in. It's like what Hippie he says. One of the best things about Hippie is, you know, he fucking, <laughs> he'd sit there and make people fucking <laughs> subscribe <laughs> and live on the fucking channel. You know what I mean? I mean, granted, once the show ends, they unsubscribe, but either way, <laughs> sort of fucking forces them to do it. But sometimes you feel like, <laughs> you feel like that. I mean, as a creator, as much as, much as I want to be like, well, fuck people, I don't give a shit if you like it. If you like it, you like it. If you don't, that's fine, fine with me. But if you're going to take the time to applaud something and say you do like it, and then don't go and fucking subscribe to it, that's fucking stupid to me. And you're no better than the fucking the dickheads in the street that have not grown up for the last 30 years. That's the way I look at it. Like. Yeah, totally. Um, subscribe to people that you actually give a shit about and want to engage with. Because... Like you're only doing, it's not only you doing the artist a disservice by subscribing and never engaging, but you're doing yourself a disservice because you're clogging up your YouTube or your Facebook or whatever social media it is with stuff that you're not engaging with, that you're sw having to swipe past. And I think um, to, it's it's one of the reasons I haven't done a show, a weekly show where I showcase people's music. Because um, I like to just play someone's song at the start of my show each day. Because I'm a teacher, that's what my show is about. I try and I want to try and help people make better music and be and be better all round. Um, so, and and I'm not putting shit on anybody who's doing those shows. Trust me, I think they're awesome, right? For getting music out there. But at the same time, I do see sometimes a bit of bit of the unproductive 
compliments where there's somebody may need some work on something and it's not being discussed openly because people's feelings get hurt man don't yeah. they they get hurt and that is one of the reasons i have a patreon so you can come over join the patreon and be a part of a small group of people and submit your songs to be mastered and you can have a much less unpublic scrutiny to to hopefully get better because in the public realm not everybody wants to say exactly what they want to feel or what they're feeling you know in fear of hurting people's feelings but there's ways to go about it as well. You know, you don't need to be an asshole about it. There's just ways to go about it. And I think that's what people are afraid of. They're afraid of saying anything. You know, just if it's constructive, it doesn't have to be dealt in a negative way. And and also, there's people out there that make music that aren't that confident. And it takes them a long time to expose themselves to communities and to groups like this. And if you've got 100 people saying this is amazing, you know, they're on cloud nine rightfully so but if 10 of those 100 then subscribe or only watch their their song on here or hippies channel or yml or whatever the fuck channels are out there and they don't subscribe then that person who built up that small bit of confidence that they needed can just go straight back down to the bottom fucking step so there's those things to consider as well and i, and I don't think people do i just think it's a case of i think you're awesome when you come and think i'm awesome as well and that, that's not me it's not my way of doing it. I'm not saying anybody shouldn't do it. It's up to you. But you're asking me the question, and that's what I fuck. Yeah, Pete calls them vanity metrics, and that's what they are. And sometimes you can have as many subscribers that, that are a number that give you pleasure to, to see this many people like you. But if nobody's engaging, it can be quite um, isolating, I think, uh, especially if people mm -hmm. aren't giving you any uh, like positive feedback to get better. I think, you know, and, and it's one of the things I see in even Facebook groups. Sometimes I'll post something on a Facebook group, and if I want feedback, I'll write it. I'll say, here's something I'm working on. Give me some feedback. But if I don't write, give me some feedback, I'm not asking for it. But then I get people go, well, I think you should do this. And it's like, well, motherfucker, I didn't ask for your feedback. Okay, so shut the fuck up. I know where this is heading. I'm just letting you have a listen to it. So calm, cool your jets. Chill the fuck out, and it'll be ready soon. <laughs> it, it also has a fucking impact as well. I mean, you know, sometimes it blows up certain things that aren't that good, and the stuff that's really good gets falls by the wayside. You know what I mean? It's like, from the way that I operate, if I like something, like, I'll go and fucking buy your shit. But, but equally, if you release something that didn't, I wasn't fucking bad. The same with Sai, Ross, fucking... Other people we won't mention that we've wasted money on. And yeah, they'll go and do it. That's the way to do it. That's how I grew up. That's why I'm into music by fucking supporting it. You know what I mean? If I ever had downloaded something, you know, illegally, if I like it, I'll go and fucking buy it. And I just think that sort of gets lost a little bit as well, you know? I'm going to cover a couple more things before we head off and play the last song. Uh, actually, I'll play two more songs um, for today. I want to have a look at this, your workflow. So GarageBand is your tool. I, I was about to say, what the fuck's that? What's the name? All right. <laughs> GarageBand on iOS is your workflow. Hello, Thomas Galane. Happy New Year to yeah. you as well. Good to see you. Um, so GarageBand iOS is your workflow. Tell me how you do these drums. Walk us through it. <laughs> <laughs> Walk us through it, Kev. <laughs> Fuck me. Um, Look at them, folks. I mean, it, it, it looks complicated, it is complicated, but it really is. <laughs> uh, well, it, it, yeah, it looks complicated. Putting it together. I mean, I take a lot of pleasure in putting the drums together because once you'd sent me that sample pack, fucking last year maybe eight, nine months ago no longer last year probably um and i start, stopped using the auto drummer because the auto drummer was a means to an end but when i realized you could do this i mean obviously i, I go to town on it but it's as much as it can be an, a ball lake because they're all samples and ios craps itself a lot of the time it's a very straightforward process i mean i just get the beats for the parts and then you know, it's it's just a case of copy and paste on the keyboard, um, and obviously then you work on the fills and things separately. But it looks complicated, but it's not. Getting them to sound right 
is the hard bit. Trying to get them to sound live, you know, like a real drummer, that's the hard bit. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going to play a section of it. Which I'm getting better. This is Chaos Bringer. I'll play a section of it because we're going to end with that today. So I'll turn down this for a second. These are the drums. I'm going to just, I'm going to solo out the drums even. Let's do this. Let's solo out the drums. So this is how Kev does it. So he imports these samples, which are from a sample pack that I openly offer on my YouTube channel. Let's have a listen to them. <laughs> Probably not the best place to start. <laughs> a few gaps there. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Now, if you look at these folks, this is this is love, right? So you've got at the top there the kicks. You've got two channels of kicks. Yep, two kicks. There's two channels of snares. Two channels of snares. I learned, learned the hard way that I used to have one kick, one snare, but you weren't getting the decay, the natural decay, which sort of made it sound more mechanized. But when you're doubling them up and allowing the space between the, the kicks and the snares, you get a more natural sound. So, it, it is metal as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> like, the problem is with it, as we've discovered, is that it slows down GarageBand big time. You know, it it, 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 it puts a lot of pressure on the the uh, system. And, and iPads don't have a lot of RAM as it is. So, you know, there's a lot of pressure on it. So anything else that you add to it, it starts like GarageBand starts shitting itself. So, yeah, so we, we've we moved to this stage now where you've sent me, so I'm just finding uh, to see a merge tracks where what you did was, here's the same track. We'll bring this up here. Where you merge them all. Well, they're kind of merged. This one, yeah, they're kind of merged. That's not merged. That's not the merge section. Whoa, where am I? Um... Merge, merge tracks to see your album, merge tracks. There it is. Why is it not merged? Uh, I know, I know. You keep clicking on the wrong one. I think it's Chaos Bringer 2. You're right. There it is there. Good job. <laughs> Thank God you know what's going on. Oh, no, 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 it's still there. I think I actually moved it to another folder. Oh, I, I clearly I think I called on. it um, to see a merge tracks album. There we go. I think that's it no man why have i not got merged of i should have merged copies here that is weird i don't know why that is the serial album, album maybe uh that's when i had open no oh look at that <laughs> and and this hey. this is why i'm doing this so we would constantly get this audio unit extension quit. And it's super frustrating. It's not because the audio unit is actually uh, dying. It's because there's so much going on that it can't handle it. Yeah. I don't know why that is. It's, uh, I guess it's GarageBand at the end of the day. Um, so I thought it was this one here, Chaos Bringer 2. For some reason... This one's not merged. I don't know why. But yeah, that is that is your process. And now, you know, if I open another one that's in here, I bet this is all merged. I don't know why that one's not merged. So if I open Sirens of War, yeah, this one's merged. So we got to the point where we had to do this. So all these drums now are merged into one track. So now you'll see... Because we were getting these crashes going on, yeah, and um, it was a, it was a big problem for Kev for me because every few takes I would try and record vocals and it would we'd get this um, audio unit has crashed, but it's yeah. So Thomas Christ has written in the chat, oh Garage Band, lol. <laughs> it's the joy of using Garage Band, isn't oh, it? God, really, <laughs> like it's awesome, but. It has its problems. For sure. 
Well, once we got around that, once you get around the fucking ball ache of doing an entire album, you know, because you get like 14 tracks, 15 tracks, and, you know, when you merge it, it creates another track, and you're just like, Jesus Christ. Um, but I'm doing it nice, song by song, as I go along. Once I get all the drums done, it just merge all the drums. But it's, it's definitely, it's the way around it, because I've always said, you know, I don't want to check out a few other programs, maybe get a few other devices, but I mean, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer in do what works when it works. Yeah. And uh, that's been that's been the, uh, the way around it for me. Um, and I love Gary's band. I love the simplicity of it. I, I love that every time I release something, if it, it like Ron plays it or Tom plays it, Tom Christ on his show, they're always like done in Gary's band. You know, as if as if it's you know, fuck me, that sort of. And I'm like, well, yeah, I thought everybody was doing this in Gary's band. I didn't realize people weren't. Well, it amazes me to hear metal in GarageBand. It still does. You know, I've made all the metal that I make, I've made in GarageBand as well, like FMC, whatever it is. Um, you know, most of it's been made in GarageBand or either then moved over to something else. Um, but GarageBand isn't just loops. It's not just, you know, uh, basic stuff. You can make some very, very intricate metal in it. And I... I think when I was in the US, I hung out with some people who were metalheads and I played them my music and said, yeah, I made this in GarageBand on iOS. And the amount of eye rolls I got from people was just like, oh, dude, you're a wanker. As soon as you roll your eyes over whatever door you're using, it's like, oh, dude, fuck off. Get out of my face. You you don't understand metal. Well, that's the thing. And it's like when people say to you about moving, well, you should try this, you should try this. I'm like, well, why? Because I'm not going to suddenly introduce the fucking mandolin or a fucking banjo. You know, I can do what the fuck I need in this shit. So it's just it's just one tool for me to record what I need to record. Plus I would have to start learning something else again and I'm like, ah oh, fuck this. Come be yours with that. So uh, we're at the stage obviously you you use um, a lot of guitar stuff um, apps for iOS. So I want to bring up apps. Let's bring up this screen here. What are the your go-to for guitar sims on iOS? Well, prior to about three weeks ago, it was always Homebridge. Always. It was, it was the only guitar uh, app that I used because it's yeah. the balls. And it still is, even though I've replaced it. I still love it. What blows my mind and it's something you constantly say, is this fucking thing's free? And I couldn't believe this was free when I found it. I was like, what the fuck? The amount of money we used to spend on amps and heads and pedals, and you just get this motherfucker, and it's, I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can type in whatever if you want to sound like Metallica or Megadeth or Slayer or whatever, but you can take those bass tones, and once you start working with your EQ, you can get some really awesome tones i mean the first three the sear albums are all yep, absolutely i mean you can set up pedal boards with it i mean i'm just bringing up my pedal boards here from what i use for fmc and and you can see here oh i've got distortion yeah look at that yeah. <laughs> no oh i better close that that didn't work too well but yeah, you can you can pick any band in there, <laughs> any band, and just find that tone. What were the two tones you used on the first this year album from using Tone Bridge? It was Machine Head, the Machine Head Imperium tone, because it's got a really good scooped weight to it, and there's there's balls in it. You know, it doesn't have that thin '80s Testament sound. <laughs> there's balls in it, and then just with a bit of EQ. Um, it just brings it out, and then there was there was that tone on carcass, the carcass uh, surgical steam tone that they used on that album, which was just it's the balls, you know, it's great. Um, and it took moving on to the next album, it took the rhino up for me to for or to highlight to me the the fall down of tone yeah. bridge. Um, because once once I started to use Rhino, and I always pan my, my guitars left and right, so I do a left and a, and a recorder left and a recorder right. Um, the separation that you get with Rhino is, I mean, it's huge. The difference is night and day. So it's not to take anything away from Tonebridge. It's absolutely brilliant, especially if you're starting off. And I used it for a year. 
it's fucking spot on. But once you get into a bit more into like the production side of things and understanding productions a bit better, you can understand why the likes of Rhino, as it is in its form now, because when we were working on the beta, I didn't like the beta, <laughs> but in the form that it has now, it's it's just great. Rhinos, it's the ball. It's like looks complicated, but it fucking isn't. It's so good, and you can get such heavy, heavy stuff out of it. And again, you don't have to use everything that's in it. You can just take those tones and work with the upper EQ. That's what I do. And that's how I got the tones that I have. Um, it's like when I sent my stuff into what's his fucking face, the shouty guy, Glenn, Glenn Fricker. Like I thought he was going to rip the fuck out of it, but he didn't. <laughs> I was like, all oh, right, he must be doing something right. Um, and that was Rhino stuff on, on the shit that he played. So, yeah, Rhino. I mean, I, I use a huge amount of apps. That, that would really yeah. be it. So, yeah, let's talk about that before we uh, play the last track. Um, so you recently sent your music into Glenn Fricker from Spectre Sound, and I did it with Methiest, and he shat all over Methiest. <laughs> he destroyed me. And that was cool. But, like, he gave you a pretty good damn review. Mm. Surprising. It was actually Tom, Thomas Christ that said to me, oh, you should put in this guy. And at first I didn't know who he was talking about. But then when I, because Tom said his name and I didn't know the guy's name. But then when he said Spectre Sound, I was like, oh, fuck, I know that cunt. Fuck him. You know what I mean? It can't be ours. So like, yeah, he just shouts at everybody. But then when Thomas said, no, that's just his thing. You know what I mean? If you actually take the time, he is quite good. Um, so yeah, as as a surprise, more surprise than anybody. And I think, I think it's because if anybody who watches that channel, the guy's always going yeah. on about songs. So even though I've got a lot of riffs, I don't do that fucking riffs for the sake of riffs thing. It's yeah. always about the song, and I, and I think that's why he was less harsh on it because at least there was a fucking song there. You know, it wasn't like twenty minutes of guitar solos. Absolutely, it was so. Uh, look, I loved watching that happen. It was so cool. To see somebody I know actually get like a, a decent uh, review. I know uh, Gary Hubbs got a decent kind of thing too when he did a cover and sent it in. So, but it was good seeing somebody send in an original track and get like, yeah, it was awesome, awesome stuff. So uh, we'll we'll close out and then um, we'll have a chat afterwards. We'll so stay on the line. What's uh, coming forward for the future of film for you? for a middle shack and of course the series which is in my ballpark <laughs> you fucking asked me about that I don't know about that <laughs> uh, the film stuff I don't know I want to do a, a video for one of the songs from the Black Magic Matters EP that I released a couple of weeks ago but I wanted to do a proper video because I mean I spoke to you and said about it many times Luma Fusion is great Storyblocks is great but it's it's very very limited in what you can do and you notice the more and more people that use story blocks you'll see the more and more shots out of the same um you know it's not as precise as you'd want it to be it's certainly great for you know for it done me, me or the couple videos that i've done for the uh begin again but yeah as far as film is concerned i really want to film a proper video i've got a script for one of the songs um i've got a script for a Desir song um metal shag you know, Metal Shack's fucking... I've got, like, a song for Metal Shack every two days. But I've been sort of taking my foot off the gas a wee bit because it's a lot... You know, it's putting out a lot. And I was like, right, fuck this. I need to take a wee step back and might do some acoustic stuff. Still working on the Seer riffs for album 17. And then... <laughs> and then the Seer comes out when the Seer comes out. Um, I'm, I'm in no to hear that early this year so the latest uh, um, Metal Shack album is the uh, Black Magic Matters EP which is up on the screen here folks please go over and subscribe if you like what Kev does if you don't don't bother man because like he, he wants you to interact yeah and, and check out the abundance of uploads that he puts up all the time I oh, know Thomas Christ album 17 I just glossed over that um <laughs> she was like, yeah, we'll go and check this out. <laughs> I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to thank you, Kev, for coming on on New Year's Eve. I know it's uh, it's late there where you are. 
and it's it's so good to finally have you on to have one of my best mates on the show to just chat shit really about metal and about what you're doing uh because what you're doing is awesome and you know i love your music not only do i love you as a friend but everything you drop i just go fuck yeah man and all my mates here in australia like riley the people you've met through me all love the shit that you do you are a prolific awesome riffer uh i don't know i feel very privileged to be able to be adding vocals to the Desia stuff because you are such this hidden gem that I amazingly found on the internet. Um, so I thank you very much for that. No, thank you. I appreciate it. You know what I appreciate it, Donnie. I appreciate it as a friend, and you know that. Um, I appreciate the sexy photographs <laughs> you send me every I week. I mean, I appreciate it all. <laughs> no, it's not every week, it's bi weekly. <laughs> but. Uh, but listen, it's like I say, it, even if the music wasn't there, we'd still yeah. be friends, and that's yeah. the main thing. So I appreciate you giving me the time, and I appreciate anyone who's spent the last nearly two hours listening to us talk <laughs> utter fucking fanning. We, with this, and I'll just throw in cunt, fuck, fuck, dick, dick bollocks, pedo, hanger, nonce, no fuck, <laughs> let's just get them all out now. <laughs> get them all in there, Jared Holy. <laughs> Thank you all for being here, folks. Today, uh, how we're going to end the show is, of course, we are going to do this. Let me bring it up on my screen. We are going to go out with a Desir track. We're going to go out with K uh, Chaos Bringer. And, um, yeah, this is still an unlisted track on my YouTube channel, so you're getting to hear it here as if you hadn't, haven't heard it before. <laughs> and... Um, Head over to Hippie's channel uh, now. He's going to be playing metal for the next 20,000 uh, hours over at Hippie's channel. But thank you all for being here. Yeah. <laughs> this is Chaos Bringer. Stay on the line, Kevin. We'll chat afterwards. Let's do it. Chaos Bringer. We're ending it. Happy New Year to everybody. I hope you have a sick 2022. I hope you get drunk and do all the things that make you happy. Keep making mistakes. They make you better. All that stuff. And I'll see you if you're a Patreon tomorrow and all that jazz. Let's go out with Desia, Chaos, Bringer. Bye-bye. Let me just sort that. So unprofessional. Let's do it. Bye.